Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I'm your host, Ian R. Buck, and today we'll be talking about the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, aka the reason you've been getting so many emails about companies updating their privacy policies. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED32. All right, so general data protection regulation, um, more commonly referred to as the GDPR. What the heck is this thing? So this is a law that the EU Parliament adopted in 2016, and it becomes enforceable on May 25th, 2018, uh, which means that it is already in effect. So because this is an EU law, you might think it kind of strange that an American podcast is talking about it. Why does it, why does it affect uh, us over here? Well, um, it's a very interesting law because it applies to data protection and privacy for all individuals in the EU, but the key point is that it includes the export of personal data outside of the EU. So this law is going to apply if the data controller, the data processor, or the data subject are in the EU. So data controller uh, being any company that, you know, collects data on a person. Um, A data processor is going to be any company that uh, manipulates that data in any way on behalf of a data controller. And the data subject, of course, is the person, the individual uh, whose personal information this is that we're talking about. So traditionally, the way that, that laws pertaining to the internet have worked is that it all really depends on like where the company in question exists uh, and where their data centers exist, right? So for a really long time, Facebook only had data centers in the United States. So United States law was the only one that uh, applied to them. They didn't have to worry about governments in any other areas of the world making laws about privacy policy or anything like that. Um, and in fact, when, uh, when I was studying abroad in Sweden uh, in 2014, um, it was kind of a, a, a big deal in the town that I was in, Luleå, Sweden, uh, because they had a Facebook data center there. And this was the very first data center that Facebook had built in Europe. And, uh, and so I believe what I heard at the time was that Facebook was... Um, storing some information there, but they weren't storing things like photos at that data center because they wanted to be able to do more with those, with that information, with those photos uh, than European law would allow them to do. Um, so nowadays, that kind of trick won't protect Facebook from uh, this from the general data protection regulation um, because it applies no matter where in the world uh, Facebook is storing that that data um, and this probably still wouldn't be a, a big issue uh, on if, if the European Union wasn't such a large signif- significant market um, so because these companies have many 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 customers in the EU um, they could comply with this law by making privacy policies specifically for uh, European citizens and then applying other policies to the rest of us. But because they're, they have to go and, um, and apply those in so many cases anyway, uh, most companies are just finding that it is much easier to apply these requirements to all of their users. Um, and so as a U.S. citizen... Uh, I'm very used to, like, the politics here in my country having an outsized effect on other parts of the world. Um, And I don't feel good about that, but, you know, that that is the reality. Uh, And it's very strange for me being on the receiving end of that kind of thing, where another country is making laws that directly affect how I am um, 
experiencing my life, right? The only other example of this that I can really think of is um, when the EU created laws around like websites that that um, serve cookies and things like that uh, for tracking purposes. And so like many, many, many websites just started showing um, the these required uh, banners that they had to show to EU citizens in order, you know, s- saying, hey, we use cookies, this is what they're for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it was much easier for them to just show those banners to everybody, whether they were in the United or in the European Union or not. Now, this is the kind of thing that has led me to the conclusion that the nation state doesn't really make much sense in the 21st century as being the major seat of political power because uh, from a technological standpoint, from a media standpoint, we have these you know worldwide distribution platforms on the internet that transcend and uh, all of these different laws and borders and it you know it, it's it's not feasible for one person one creator uh to keep track of what kind of content is legal in different uh in different jurisdictions um and you know it's it's possible for larger companies to do that when they're creating media but for a small creator like me um that's just not doable and uh and we you know we could get into all of the other like um financial angle of this and and the political angle of this um but as a media person that's where i'm coming from is uh, and as somebody who grew up uh in the 21st century i consider myself to be a citizen of the internet more than a citizen of any one country um, because that is where like everything that I hold to be important has happened in my life you know and the way that a law that is created in the EU which is itself an organization that is larger than the nation states that make up its members can affect the way that uh, I use the internet here in the United States, I think is is pretty major evidence uh, for what I'm saying here, that um, I think we should have some some sort of governing body that is, uh, you know, above all of these nation states. And obviously not everything that governs our lives would fall under the jurisdiction of that entity, but like major things that, you know, would make sense like... Uh, regulations regarding internet usage and you know the transmission of data and so i'll end my little rant there so what kinds of things are changing as a result of the gdpr well first there are a few very specific rights that the gdpr affords to data subjects um first It gives us the right to explanation of algorithmic decisions. Um, And this is probably the one that is the least well-defined in the law and is going to, it's going to be debated a lot in courts. And so we're going to find out what what exactly that means uh, from a legal standpoint as as time goes on and as different court cases uh, get settled. The right of access specifies that subjects are allowed to access their personal data and information about how it is being processed. The right to erasure, uh, which is kind of similar to the right to be forgotten, which you may be familiar with that the EU introduced um, a while ago and uh, made a lot of headlines because um, Google as a search engine was being required to remove uh, links to sites that had information about particular people, um, even though Google themselves was not hosting that uh, information. Uh, but the right to erasure is a little bit different than the right to be forgotten. Um, it simply sa- states that uh, data subjects have the right to request the erasure of their personal data from a, uh, a company's records. And then the right to data portability. Um, 
says that data subjects must be able to transfer their personal data from one processing system to another, um, except for data that has been fully anonymized, of course, uh, because in that case you would not be able to like find that person's specific data. Um, and this also means that the data that is being provided uh, must be in a structured and commonly used format. So this is a very, very interesting um, point. And we'll get into it a little bit more later. But I would really love to have this ability to very easily switch between different services um, without having to go through a huge hassle. Because that is one of the ways that companies... Um, kind of lock us into their ecosystems, right, is by making it very difficult to extract our data from them. Another very important point in the GDPR is that law enforcement agencies in third country jurisdictions cannot require a processor or controller to disclose personal data on an individual in the EU unless the EU and that country have an international agreement allowing it. So this is going to get to the heart of what a lot of U.S. Um, law enforcement agencies, especially federal law enforcement agencies, uh, have been trying to do, which is, you know, um, getting United States-based companies that have United States-based data centers to hand over data on their users, um, especially when those users are not uh, U.S. citizens. Uh, much of the debate here in this country around like data privacy has kind of hinged on whether or not a person is from the United States or not. Now, if you ask me, that kind of attitude is complete BS because a person should have the same rights no matter where they're from, no matter where they are. Uh, everybody in the world should have the same protections from our judicial and law system. And so the EU is kind of preempting that by, uh, by forcing companies to not hand over data uh, to you know, United States um, law enforcement agencies unless the United States and the EU have some agreement uh, along those lines. And since, you know, the United States and the EU are on pretty good terms, um, I suspect that they probably do have those kinds of agreements going on. Now, all of these requirements would be pretty useless if we cannot determine whether a company is following them or not. And so there is a lot more disclosure that has to go on. Um, companies uh, must disclose what data they are collecting from the user, how long they are going to retain that personal information, uh, and the contact information for a data controller officer. Data controllers also must demonstrate that they implement privacy by design and by default. And that's a, pri that's a phrase that's going to pop up a lot, is privacy by design and by default. There's a lot of different techniques that go into this kind of, of you know, new uh, data protection scheme. The EU has put forth a few specific things, um, but there's, you know, there, this, this is a field that's probably going to develop a lot over time uh, on finding like best practices that um, fall under GDPR. Um, but currently the way that they are defining it is uh, encryption would be one option, right? Um, as long as the decryption key is stored separately, of course. Um, tokenization would count as well, where any personal identifiers are replaced with other identifiers uh, of the same type and length, and that's that type of thing is uh, important. Uh, depend, you know, if you're using like an older um, database system where it, you know, it can't handle having different types of data in the same uh, data field, etc. Um, and uh, and together, these these types of methods are are uh, called pseudonymizing, which I I think is a you know a, a portmanteau of pseudo and anonymizing, um, which literally just means like any any method that makes it so that if somebody gains access to this data set, they can't identify 
who the data is for. Um, but if you take this data set and combine it with another data set uh, that, you know, can identify the people, then you'll be able to match up a person's uh, identity with their personal uh, information. GDPR also specifies that encryption and decryption must be carried out locally, uh, not by remote service, which is a very strange ask in 2018, where so many things are run on cloud services. And so the way that I interpret this is that um, like cloud storage is is you know well and fine as long as the data controller is loading the information from their cloud storage onto a machine that they themselves control doing any encryption and decryption on it uh, there on their machine locally and then they can send you know that uh, the the new information that they have encrypted or decrypted uh, back to to whatever cloud storage service they are using. Now, even though a data controller has collected personal data on a user, um, they are still restricted on what they're allowed to do with it. Um, the data may not be processed in any way unless there is at least one lawful basis to do so. And the GDPR lists several uh, of these lawful bases. Um, one of them is the data subject has given consent to the processing of personal data for one or more specific purposes. Uh, and we'll get into consent a little bit more in a moment. Two, processing is necessary for the performance of a contract to which the data subject is party or to take steps at the request of the data subject prior to entering into a contract. So again, that is specifically applying to things that the data subject is asking the data controller to do with their information. Three, processing is necessary for compliance with a legal obligation to which the controller is subject. So basically saying, if there's a law that requires you to do something with this, then the GDPR isn't going to get in the way of that. Four, processing is necessary to protect the vital interests of the data subject or of another natural person. And that's a very interesting point there, is that the, the data subject themselves are not the only ones whose interests must be protect uh, under this law. Any other individual person um, also must be protected. Five, Processing is necessary for the performance of a task carried out in the public interest or in the exercise of official authority vested in the controller. And six, processing is necessary for the purposes of the legitimate interests pursued by the controller or by a third party, unless such interests are overridden by the interests or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject, which require protection of personal data, in particular if the data subject is a child. So that last point almost unravels the rest of the law because it's almost saying that like any company that has collected data can do anything that they want with it if it serves their own legitimate interest. And because legitimate interest is not very well defined here, um, the only thing that's holding this point back is that it can't overrule the interests or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject themselves. And so I think that that is kind of the, the crux of this entire um, this entire law is that the, the data subjects rights come above all others. So let's get into this question of consent, because this is one of the big places where things are changing. Uh, traditionally, on the internet if you you know go and uh, load up some some website you want to make an account there and, and use their services uh, or you download some software and you install it on your computer um, almost always before you can use any any software you have to agree to the 
EULA, the End User License Agreement. You have to agree to their terms of service. You have to agree to their privacy policy. And all of those documents, all of those rules are very, very, very long. Nobody has time to read any of them. Uh, most users don't have the expertise to read through them and uh, and understand what they are saying. There was a, a, a moment that... Uh, gained a lot of attention when the U.S. Congress was um, was having a hearing with Mark Zuckerberg recently regarding the uh, Cambridge Analytica um, data breaches, where one of the uh, senators, you know, had a print-off of uh, Facebook's, like, terms of service or privacy policy. I don't remember which one it exactly was. Um, and it was, you know, very, very thick uh, collection of papers and she read a passage from the beginning of it and she said uh, something along the lines of I'm a lawyer and I have no idea what that means what I just read and um, so that kind of thing is uh, going to be changing drastically here in this uh, brave new world of GDPR so consent from a data subject must be explicit for the specific data collected and the purpose it is used for. So this means that any company that wants to collect data is going to have to tell us exactly what they're going to be using that data for, um, what data it is ahead of time, right? Um, and they won't be able to like hinge the, the entire experience of us using their services based on whether or not they, we give them uh, all of that information, right? Um, so if you want to be a customer of a website and but you don't want to give them all of your information for the purposes of targeted advertising, right? Then you will be able to say no for the targeted advertising itself, uh, but still use the website without getting the advantages of targeted advertising, right? Uh, consent for children also must be given by their parent or guardian. And that kind of thing has existed for quite a while on the internet where they, uh, you know, would ask you, are you 13 years or older? Uh, and literally all of us just clicked, yes, yes, I am, uh, even if we were not. 13 or older at the time. And so I, I, I don't think that that kind of behavior is going to be prevented by the GDPR, um, but these companies will be required to kind of keep an audit trail of whether or not the, the, the user has agreed to uh, these specific um, data collections and whether or not they, they you know... Um, specified what if they were a minor or uh, or an adult data controllers also must be able to prove that the consent uh, was opt in instead of opt out uh, so they won't be able to give us like um, a form that has uh, some check boxes that are already filled in um, because unless the user proactively goes and clicks on those checkboxes, then uh, they did not properly give consent. Now, one thing that I have noticed about a lot of these emails that I've been getting from companies about regarding their privacy policies being updated is that a lot of them are still using the classic line, by continuing to use our services after May 25th, you are agreeing to the updated privacy policy, which doesn't fly under GDPR. GDPR specifically states that like they have to get explicit consent from their users and that this kind of implicit consent where they simply state that like if if you don't do anything out of the ordinary then you are agreeing to all of these terms and conditions. Um, that is exactly the kind of thing that GDPR is trying to get rid of. And also, here's a very important point, consent may be withdrawn. So if you are um, a, a user and you uh, accidentally or, you know, you, you, you agree to some terms uh, at the beginning without fully realizing what, um, you know, what the implications of them were, uh, then later on you must be able to go in and uh, 
withdraw that that consent and in those cases then the company must delete all of the information that uh, pertains to that particular piece of consent a less internet focused example of this would be uh, when you call a company right and uh, almost all of them have a little message at the beginning that says calls are recorded for training purposes um, those aren't going to be enough to gain assumed consent anymore in the EU. Um, and also, if a caller uh, you know, agrees to allow their call to be recorded for training purposes, but then later on during the call, they withdraw their consent, then the company must be able to stop the recording and, uh, and they can't save what they, what they have up to that point. Now, a very, very good point uh, about this was brought up by Ryan, uh, who frequently appears on this show. Hello. Hi. He asks, does an AI need consent to record remember a phone call at places? Um, so, of course, he's referring to uh, Google Duplex, which is um, the recently announced um, feature of uh, the Google Assistant where it will... Uh, make phone calls for you for the purposes of like scheduling appointments and things like that. Um, but also, uh, I'm thinking about this in terms of the the like our everyday interactions with the Google Assistant itself. Um, the Google Assistant makes an effort to remember what we were talking about earlier, right? In order to be able to continue a conversation uh, in in a manner that uh, that flows that makes sense. And if I have not given my my consent for this uh, this AI to like to keep all of that information, then will it be able to carry out a conversation at all? Um, probably not. Uh, I I I believe that these systems are built uh, to depend on that kind of information. And I can't imagine what would happen if in the middle of a conversation, I tell the Google Assistant that I uh, remove my consent for it to uh, store my, my personal information. Um, because, uh, I mean, at that point, the, the conversation would just basically be over. The Extra Dimension is supported only by listeners like you, who voluntarily donate on our Patreon. Money we make through Patreon will go towards buying research materials and improving the quality of the show. Our content has always been released for free and always will be. But if you go that extra mile, you can get cool rewards like day one access to The Fringe, our behind the scenes show, access to polls to help us choose future subjects for the extra dimension, access to show docs as we're working on them, Nexus stickers, your name shouted out right here on the show, and much more. Not to mention, you'll have my eternal gratitude. So if you're interested in helping us take this to the next level, join us at patreon.com slash thenexustv. Again, that's patreon.com slash thenexustv. Now, to help facilitate all of these new laws and regulations, the EU has introduced the concept of a data protection officer, which is a person with expert knowledge of data protection law and practices who assists data controllers and processors in monitoring internal compliance with GDPR. And so these are not directly government agents, uh, but they are people who, uh, again, are experts in this field. So data processors in the public sector uh, must employ DPOs, um, and data processors in the private sector whose core activities consist of processing that require regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects also must employ DPOs. So not every private company out there is going to have to employ a DPO, um, but if their core activities uh, do involve processing personal data, um, then, they, then they will need a DPO. Now, one of the big issues that has faced tech companies uh, in, our, in our digital world is data breaches. Um, quite often, they don't have 
much of an incentive to notify the public about them uh, unless uh, unless there is some action required on the user's part um, in order to secure their accounts. Um, but uh, now under GDPR, data controllers must notify the supervisory authority within 72 hours. They must uh, inform the, uh, the European Union um, entity that's in charge of them. Uh, and data controllers won't necessarily have to notify the data subjects uh, if the data was properly pseudonymized. Um, but uh, if... if there was a breach that uh, you know would involve personal data getting into the hands of some unknown third party or malicious third party, uh, then they would have to notify those users within a timely manner. Now, marketing is one of the big topics on everybody's minds whenever they talk about personal data. Um, a lot of people are very concerned with the concept of uh, targeted advertising. And under the GDPR, the processing of personal data for direct marketing purposes may be regarded as carried out for a legitimate interest. Uh, but this only applies, again, if the interests or rights of the data subject don't override the business's legitimate interest. So the GDPR won't be the end of targeted advertising. Um, it's just that the data subject will be able to remove their consent for that kind of thing. Now, what kinds of consequences can a company expect if they don't follow GDPR's regulations? Uh, well, there are some pretty big fines. Um, either 4% of a company's worldwide revenue or 10 to 20 million euros, whichever is higher. Um, and this also depends on which article of GDPR is infringed, of course. Um, each of them carries like different, uh, different consequences. But... That is a lot of money, um, especially considering that like many, many companies out there that collect uh, user data are not nearly that big. Um, this could easily end an entire company if they, if they run afoul of the GDPR. Now, there are several things that are not covered under GDPR. Uh, the lawful interception, national security, the army, the police, justice departments, those kinds of things, uh, those are not covered under GDPR. Statistical and scientific analysis is still allowed under GDPR. Deceased persons are subject to national legislation, so each uh, country within the EU still has their, their own laws uh, for people who have passed away. Uh, there's also a dedicated law separate from the GDPR on employer-employee relationships. And I did not look into that law, so I can't tell you the specifics of it. And also the processing of personal data by a natural person in the course of a pure, purely personal or household activity uh, is not, not covered under GDPR, um, which is probably good because uh, if all of us had to worry about, you know, obtaining people's specific consent in order to uh, have their, their contact information in our contacts list, uh, it could get pretty out of hand pretty quickly uh, because I don't know about you, but I do not keep a, an audit trail of all of the people whose, uh, whose email addresses I put into my contacts list. There have been several criticisms leveled uh, at the GDPR. Um, of course, there are expected uh, administrative costs that go above and beyond what we have seen before, um, which is to be expected for, for any, uh, any regulation of this kind. Um, but also, like companies and organizations have had to invest a lot of money and effort in order to comply with GDPR. Um, 
and uh, and those those costs are not just upfront costs of you know having to reevaluate their privacy policies and making them simpler to read, um, but you know as as we saw, they now have to employ. Uh, the data protection officers, um, which is going to be an added cost going forward. Uh, data portability, that the, the right of data portability, has also come under fire because um, it is not strictly necessary for the purposes of data protection. Uh, it's more of a feature. And, and, I, and I can see where that argument is coming from, but at the same time, I do believe that data portability is a very important aspect of disallowing monopolies and uh, and anti-competitive practices and so even though it is not it is not strictly a privacy and data protection issue um, I am very glad that uh, data portability was included in the GDPR there's been criticism that the GDPR does not provide enough guidance on what constitutes appropriate data de-identification. So the uh, the brief, you know, little bit about uh, encryption and tokenization and pseudonymizing that I talked about before is that's about as much as the GDPR really says on the subject. Um, so we may see additional materials being created and released uh, as we go forward. Um, otherwise, the GDPR uh, may come under fire in courts uh, regarding, you know, when it comes to a, a company that claims that they have properly anonymized uh, information, but, um, um, but they are getting sued for it anyway. Blockchain systems uh, do not mesh with the GDPR very well. Um, in fact, implementing GDPR in a blockchain system is probably impossible because um, blockchains... We have not had an episode here on the Extra Dimension explaining what blockchain is yet. Um, I do plan on making an episode uh, about that in the future, so let me know if you uh, would be interested in that. Um, but for now, know that uh, the blockchain is a uh, distributed system where any transactions that happen in the blockchain system uh, is recorded on every single computer that is a part of that blockchain network. And so, uh, and, and the ledger for each blockchain is permanent by, by design. Um, and it is also public by design. And so, any private information, any any personal information that is recorded in a blockchain system uh, cannot be deleted, cannot be removed, and it cannot be made anonymous anymore. Um, and so, so that is going to be uh, a very, a very tough uh, battle, I think, between the GDPR and between these uh, blockchain systems that are becoming very popular. There's also a lack of expertise in the area of data protection and privacy legislation in the tech sector. So we are uh, definitely going to see a shortage of data protection officers. And so you can definitely expect uh, there to be a, a scramble uh, for people to get educated, to get trained on, uh, on this kind of thing. The GDPR also makes uh, different references to consent and explicit consent, but does not do a very good job of defining what the difference is between those two. Uh, it also does not do a very good job of defining what exactly the legitimate interest of a company is. Um, we do know that marketing falls under legitimate interests of a company, um, but it, other than that, it has been left uh, rather open-ended. And I am also left wondering um, how these requirements apply to someone like myself who, um, for example, I manage the social network accounts of not only my, my personal self, but also of the, uh, the, the podcast network here, the Nexus TV. Um, and so people who are interacting with the Nexus TV online uh, are going to be seeing it and, and perceiving it as a company, as a, you know, as an entity. Um, and uh, especially now that we have a Patreon set up, um, 
the we you know we do have access to some information uh, about our patrons. Um, for example, we have a list of email addresses, right? And Patreon uh, supplies that to us for the purposes of like putting together a newsletter. And so, so from the outside, it would seem that the GDPR would apply to the Nexus TV and to how we treat that personal information. Um, but the Nexus TV is not actually a company legally. Um, in reality, it's just a you know a few individuals. We all have access to the Nexus TV's accounts, um, but uh, you know where where does where does the is the line drawn uh, between like the Nexus? Where does where does the Nexus TV end and where does E and R Buck begin? Um, that is uh, something that that is not very well defined. Finally, let's take a look at a case study of uh, the changes that a, a company has had to make uh, in order to come into compliance with GDPR. Um, I took a look at Google's blog post where they outlined some of the changes that they made. Um, and Google is a company that I have held in very high regard the amount of transparency that they have given to their users regarding the personal information that they gather on us and what they use it for. And, uh, and so when I first saw, you know, information about the GDPR, um, I didn't, I didn't think that, uh, Google would have to make, uh, very many drastic changes, um, to, to the way that they operate in order to come into compliance with it. Um, so let's take a look. So first, their privacy policy. Um, they have reworded their privacy policy to explain practices in more detail and with clearer language. Um, they have also improved the navigation of their privacy policy when you're viewing it online. Um, no longer it is, is it a monolithic single document, as many privacy policies are, um, but now it actually has... Um, you know, different sections. You can navigate around with the sidebar in order to jump from uh, from spot to spot. Um, so if you're looking for a, a specific piece of the privacy policy, you can very easily find it. Uh, they've also added explanatory videos and illustrations uh, and embedded those into the privacy policy when you're viewing it on their web page, which I think is very, very impressive. Um, that's a great move and uh, and will definitely help um, a lot of people who, who, you know, just don't want to read such a huge block of text, uh, in order to, in order to understand what their, what the privacy policy is saying. Uh, and they're also adding links into the privacy policy that will bring you straight to the applicable privacy setting, uh, that the privacy policy is currently talking about. So if you read something in the privacy policy and you want to go and check to see what your, what your settings currently allow or disallow, uh, you can very easily go and find those settings. Google has also made some changes to their uh, My Account Settings page. They have on-off switches for things like location history, YouTube search history, um, those kinds of uh, features that, that you can opt out of without uh, directly affecting the rest of your, your um, experience with your Google account. They've made it much easier to browse the data that Google has on file. You can actually search by topic, date, and product now. Um, I believe that previously, uh, many of the things that, uh, I believe that you were able to view all of this data um, somehow, but it was not all housed under the same roof. So for example, if you wanted to see the, uh, or listen to the recordings of your voice that they had from the, uh, from the Google assistant, uh, you'd have to go into your app settings in the Google assistant and find, find those recordings that way. Um, whereas if you wanted to say, take a look at your YouTube search history, then you would have to go into the YouTube app. Uh, and, I, and I believe that all of those things are still available in their individual places, um, but you can find all of your, all of your personal data um, all in one place on the My Account Settings page now. And when you find those things, you can actually delete specific items uh, or entire days or entire weeks of activity uh, all at once. Um, which is a very, very powerful tool. In the area of data portability, um, Google already had a download your data tool. Um, 
but it was a kind of a one-time thing, uh, and then uh, you would have to remember to come back and do it again if you if you ever wanted uh, updated versions of your of your data. Um, they're now adding a setting that lets you schedule regular downloads, um, and that kind of thing was not really stipulated in GDPR. So this is uh, this seems to be Google going above and beyond, um, and uh, and offering. Uh, a, a feature. Uh, Google is also starting an open source uh, data transfer project to provide tools for developers to offer data transfer uh, from one service directly to another. Uh, and it, it seems like this is going to um, be available for all kinds of different uh, uh, data. You know, so if I want to uh, move all of my RSS feed subscriptions from one RSS reader to another. Um, I'll be easily be able to do that um, if, uh, if, if both RSS readers uh, take advantage of this data transfer project. Um, but also I could move uh, photos from like Google Photos over to Flickr or to... Um, does Microsoft have like a... a OneDrive photos thing? I don't know. Uh, but that kind of thing. If all of those companies use this data transfer project, um, then uh, then they'll it'll be very, very easy to, to transfer stuff from one place to another. Um, and it's, it, of course, open source projects, uh, you know, it's unknown uh, if, if, if this particular one is going to catch on and become like the standard in the future uh, or not. But I think it would be very, very good to have uh, kind of one one standard that everybody uses. As for parental consent, uh, Google is rolling out the family link, which is uh, an, an already existing feature where um, parents can create a Google account for their children who are minors, uh, and then that Google account is uh, managed by the parent uh, until that, uh, that minor uh, becomes, I believe, 13 years of age. Um, and uh, uh, but Family Link uh, was was not quite rolled out to all countries in the EU before now, uh, but Google has done that um, to in order to comply with GDPR. Uh, and then, of course, Google has a lot of other companies who they work with, who they service, um, and so they are working with their partners to help them gather uh, user consent uh, in a way that uh, that falls under GDPR. Uh, and then, of course, they are now employing full-time privacy experts. So those would be the data protection officers that we talked about earlier in this episode. Uh, Google did not specify how many full-time privacy experts they're employing, uh, but they, they did say that they are employing them now. So all in all, it seems like the changes that Google has had to make were more of the like user facing um things and less of the um back end server infrastructure type things um because google has has you know always taken security very very seriously um so i don't think that they had to update their security practices very much um they also uh to the best of my knowledge have have always been very careful with the ways that they share uh, user information with with other companies. Um, so I don't think that they. It doesn't seem like they had to uh, change those practices very much. Um, but they did have to do some significant changes to their privacy policy in order to make it uh, easier for lay people to um, to parse through it and, and understand what it's uh, what it's saying and what each of those settings does. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Extra Dimension, a production of The Nexus TV. You can get in contact with us by email at thenexustv at gmail.com or find us on most social media platforms, including Twitter at The Nexus TV. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter at Ian R. Buck, uh, and you can find links to other stuff that I make at ianrbuck.com. This episode of The Extra Dimension is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use any part of it in any way that you want, as long as you link back to the original page, which is thenexus.tv slash TED32. 
If you want to discuss this episode with other listeners, please go to our subreddit at r slash the Nexus TV. We're always looking for interesting technology focused topics to discuss here on this show. So if you have something in mind that you think we should tackle, uh, please reach out to us and let us know. And remember that no matter how you're listening to this, you should go and subscribe to The Extra Dimension in your favorite podcast player to get each new episode as soon as it comes out. Again, thanks for listening, and have a good one.